My brother owns a really nice RV that he lets me borrow sometimes. We live 15 minutes from each other, and in a state that's known for camping, hiking, and outdoor activities in general. It was last fall when I asked if I could borrow his RV to go camping out by a small fishing pond. The weather was getting too cold to comfortably camp out in a tent, so the RV was the perfect answer. I really just wanted to spend a few days fishing out there, enjoying some time to myself. I went over and picked up the RV, then drove down to the pond. The trail definitely wasn't made for driving on. It was very narrow and only made of dirt, but I'd usually see tire marks all over it. I knew that other people had driven through this path before. This time through the trail, my path was clear of any other vehicles, and I didn't see any people around either. When I got to the pond area, it was completely deserted. I parked off to the side just in case anyone else did show up later. I got pretty much everything ready and went out to fish right away. I grabbed a couple of beers as well and just kind of sat back and relaxed. It was really nice actually. By 5 o'clock, I started cleaning up and putting all my gear back in the RV. As I was doing so, a pickup truck pulled in from the trail. It was an older, rusty truck that looked like it had been through a lot over the years. There was no camper attached to it. It was just the truck itself. It had tinted windows, so I assumed they were using the truck to sleep in. That's not the most uncommon thing I've heard of. They parked on the other side of the field and turned off their headlights, but stayed inside the vehicle. I finished packing my own things back into the RV and went in for the night. I looked out a few times to see if the truck was still there. Maybe I could introduce myself to keep things from being weird. Nothing seemed to have changed though. It was a little strange to not even attempt to say hi when you'd driven out into the middle of nowhere and happened to be in the same vicinity as someone else, but whatever. I just went on with my night. I got in bed and fell asleep by 8 o'clock. At some time during the night though, I woke up for a minute after hearing a car door open and close. I remember checking out the window and not seeing anyone. Then I went right back to sleep. In the morning, I got up and made some breakfast, then went back out to fish again. The truck was still in the exact same spot as before. It didn't look like they'd done anything or even left the vehicle at all. I sat out there fishing for well over three hours, not seeing any movement from that truck. It was actually getting kind of unsettling. Either someone was in there and for some reason not leaving at all, or they'd left in the middle of the night when I heard the door open. Both were not exactly normal behavior. It made me feel uneasy. I ended up spending the rest of the day in the RV. I couldn't help but feel like someone was watching me from inside that truck the whole time. While in the RV, I kept checking out the windows multiple times to see if there would be any change in the truck or the person inside. Very suddenly, at about 7pm, I heard the truck engine start. I looked out the window and watched as they pulled around and slowly drove up the trail like they were about to leave. Then though, they stopped right in the middle. A few seconds passed before the truck shut off once more. They were now blocking off the trail completely. Immediately, my stomach dropped. A man stepped out, clearly in a rush. He ran up to the bed of his truck and grabbed something out of the back of it. He then turned to face the RV. I left the window and locked up the door as well. I could hear footsteps running towards it. Just as I got the door locked, it started shaking aggressively as someone started tugging on it from the other side. My mind at this point was in this foggy state where I had no idea what to do. I ran to the driver's seat and started up the RV. It sounded like the man was really trying to get the door open. I pressed on the gas and went towards their truck, slowing down as I approached the back of it. I could hear the man chasing me all the while. 
I just pressed my RV right up against that truck and began to push it with force. The man ran over and tried to get back in. Before he could though, it slid off the trail and opened up a path for me to get around. I drove out of there immediately and didn't look back until I was on the main road. I went a little ways down before I called the police to report that suspicious man. By the time they got there though, the truck and man were long gone. I can't be sure exactly as to what the man was intending to do. The obvious answer is that he was trying to rob me, both of the RV and everything in it. But then, why did he spend so long watching me and setting up this whole elaborate trap? Why not just block it off right when he arrived and do everything right away? It felt as if he were watching me, waiting to see if I were alone, as if he were planning to do more than just take the vehicle and leave. I think that if things had gone any differently, I would have never been seen again after that night. I worked at a retail store in my 20s as an overnight lead. It wasn't one of your regular big chain grocery stores though. It was a local place with only about 8 or 9 locations. Most nights I'd have an overnight stalker to help out. But it wasn't uncommon for me to spend the whole shift alone. Again, it's not the biggest store around so it wasn't really a very intense working environment. A lot of the time, I'd find myself working slow just to not run out of things to do on my shift. This was one of those nights where I was alone and working at a steady pace. At the beginning of my shift, I loaded up some boxes and moved them into the aisles to start stocking. It doesn't take much mental effort, so my mind was elsewhere thinking about random things, and not really paying much attention to my surroundings. I went through about three aisles, until a knock at the front entrance made me jump in surprise. I almost didn't even realize what it was, because I was so spaced out. Once I did though, I got extremely confused instead. I heard them knock again, loud enough to echo throughout the entire store, I walked down to the end of the aisle and looked through the large front windows. I could see a man in a hood standing at the door. I went up to the other side. Uh, sir, we're closed. We won't be open until 8 a.m. I said this through the glass. The man looked at me but didn't say anything in response. I pointed at the sign on the door. We're closed, sorry. I repeated this to the man. He continued to look at me for a few moments, then turned and walked away. I watched him walk until I couldn't see him anymore, but it didn't look like he'd parked anywhere. The whole thing was odd to say the least. I figured he was just at the wrong place or something and went back to doing what I was doing. I stocked up the shelves and eventually forgot all about the man. By 2 a.m. I'd gotten through half of the aisles and was ready to take my lunch break. I left the boxes where they were and went to the break room on the other end of the building. I was in there for a good half hour before I tossed the rest of my lunch I hadn't finished and went back to work. I walked through the store and to the end of the aisle I was working on, but just as I looked up, I saw a man walking past the other end. He looked like he was just walking around the store not having noticed me at all. I froze in place, feeling an instant rush of fear. Now, listening more intently, I could hear the man's footsteps moving toward the side of the building I'd just come from. I moved into the aisle and hid behind the shelves. The footsteps sounded like they went toward the break room. Just before I left the aisle to try and run and get some help, I heard the man rushing out of the room. The footsteps were sprinting through the store, getting closer and closer. I ran for the other end of the aisle. I looked back and saw the man turn in and start running right for me. I ran to the front door 
getting my keys out and trying to unlock it with shaky hands. The man appeared at the end of the aisle just as I got it open, and just as I stepped out of the building, I saw a bright flash in the corner of my eye. I heard a popping sound that made my ears burst. A gunshot. The sound was so loud and surprising I didn't even know where the bullet had landed. I sprinted for my life around the building. I jumped into my car and hid in the back seat as I called 911. From what I know, the man didn't attempt to follow me outside. He was already gone by the time the police made it to the store. They found the back door busted open, along with some heavy tools sitting right by it. The most terrifying of their findings, though, was the hole created by the bullet sitting right to the side of the front doors. Why the man broke in and was so aggressive targeting me like that instead of just stealing something is unknown. From his behavior, the police seemed to think it was some kind of mental breakdown or psychotic break, not having any real reason to target me specifically other than the fact I was alone. I no longer work there, but I can tell you that for the years following that incident, I was on edge every single night I was there. A few years back, I was driving down to party with some friends. I was coming from my house all by myself. They lived about 30 minutes away, and the route there was pitch black. It was around 10.30 or so. So there I am driving down the road, when I see a man standing on the side of it with a small white sack in his hands. Down the road, I see a white car with its doors wide open. As I pulled up and rolled down the window slightly, the man told me his car had broken down. His hair was greasy and long, and he looked a lot like the residents of that area. Most of the people there were farmers and mechanics and the like, so he didn't look out of place or anything. I decided why not offer the man a ride then. He looked to be about 35 or so. I asked him where he was going and he said in town. I start driving and started talking. The man was a bit weird though, so eventually I stopped bothering to make conversation. Every so often he would shift his position and there would be a clattering sound from inside his bag. He said he needed to arrange a ride when he got into town and wondered if he could use my phone. I reluctantly handed it over to him, and he called someone up. He started saying he had some GPS for sale. His bag shifted around, and I could see various electronics inside. The broken down looking car he said he owned was a car he'd just stolen from, and he was trying to sell the merchandise on my phone in my car right next to me. Hey dude, when you're finished with your call, I need my phone back right away. I was trying to be cool as a cucumber. I wanted to make him think I was really, really dumb and would just take him wherever. We got about 10 minutes from where I was heading, and I knew I had to get rid of him right now. Hey brother, I need to make a call real quick so I can get in my friend's building. He reluctantly handed the phone back to me and I made a quick fake call and chucked it in the door pocket where he couldn't reach it. I asked him once again where I should drop him off, since we were now in town. Well, wherever you're going, you can drop me off there. I scanned him really quick to see if he had a weapon or something. I didn't see anything visible, but I couldn't be sure. I slowed down and stopped. Here you go, dude. I'm just going up around the corner. Nah, man, why don't you just drop me off there? I finally lost my cool. I pushed his seatbelt button and started yelling in his face. This is where I'm dropping you off, so get out already! He looked at the pocket where my phone was, then back at my face. It looked like he was thinking things over for a second, before he finally just said, Alright, dude, whatever. I squealed my tires when I pulled out and called him a piece of shit as I left him behind. Immediately, I called the police. 
A couple days later, I saw a piece in the paper saying they'd caught him. Apparently, he was a man wanted for murder. Back when I was at school, there was this old guy we called Mr. Kyokori. Not too far from our school on the way home, there was this vacant lot. Us elementary school students would go there and play after school all the time. The entrance to the vacant lot faced the road. Other than that, it was completely surrounded by apartment blocks and houses, and as such, there were fences all around our little playground, aka the vacant lot. In one of those homes lived Mr. Kyokori, one that faced our playground, in fact. Back then, we would play baseball or tag there, and it was always a really fun time. This old guy, Mr. Kyokori, would pop his head up and watch us from time to time, hence earning him that nickname, Kyokori-san. Kyokori in Japanese means to pop up from a hiding place, or to peek or peep at someone. Sometimes, without anyone noticing him, the man would pop up, and someone would eventually spot him, then quietly spread the word he was watching. That's why he was called Kyokori-san, or Mr. Pop-Up in English. I mean, we never called him that to his face or teased him or anything, and he didn't do anything to us either. We all just thought he was an old man that enjoyed watching us kids play baseball. He was a bit strange looking though. He had these really sunken in eyes, and he always looked really gloomy. To explain it, to me it always seemed like his eyebrows and the beneath part of his eyes formed like a weird figure eight. I swear as well that we could never place the expression on his face. It always looked like he was perpetually between laughing, crying, and feeling deep concern. Whenever a new kid would come along to play with us at our makeshift playground, they would always remark that Mr. Pop-Up was so creepy. But eventually, they'd just get used to him as well. It came with the territory, and I guess feeling his eyes on us every now and then was a small price to pay, to play uninterrupted. When the sun began to set, we would all head home. He'd be gone by then. I know it's kind of weird that we were all so okay with it, and that Mr. Pop-Up became a regular part of our lives. I went into the next grade of school, and eventually we grew out of playing tag and baseball in that vacant lot. When I was in the second year of high school, I happened to pass by that lot again for the first time in a few years. It looked a lot smaller than I remembered it being. I guess that's because I was a lot bigger now, though. Memories of those fun summer days of baseball with old friends came flooding back to me. I was filled with nostalgia, and a bit of sadness as well, I guess. Better days, huh? I had completely forgotten about Mr. Pop-Up. I was staring at the fences, which were now covered in moss, and I can't describe it well, but I all of a sudden felt a very odd kind of anxiety fall over me. What was this feeling, I wondered. It felt like something was out of place here. Something was bugging me, but I couldn't quite put my figure on what. I then realized what it was. When I was a child, I hadn't thought about it when Mr. Pop-Up was peeking over the fence, but this wall must have been over two meters tall. Everything seemed big at that young age, so I hadn't really put it together. If you're going to peep over this wall, you need to be at least two meters tall, or standing on some sort of raised platform. I remembered Mr. Pop-Up, and I felt a little shudder run down my spine. In the next day of high school, I told some of my friends that I used to kick about with on that vacant lot what I had discovered. We began to talk about Mr. Pop-Up again. The wall was too high to see over just by standing, so I wanted to see what kind of life he was living on the other side. It was as if someone had challenged me to go investigate. I, of course, didn't want to go by myself, though, 
so I invited three brave friends of mine to come along with me and check out the other side, Mr. Kyokuri's house. Before heading over, we confirmed with some of the younger students that Mr. Pop-Up was still active, watching some kids play soccer in the empty lot. They said they saw him very often peeking over the fence. A couple of nights later, we went over to the other side there. We discovered his house. The moment we arrived, I wanted to go home immediately. I had this terrible feeling that something bad was going to happen. I didn't want to look like a wuss though, so I kept my mouth shut. His house looked like one of those 50-year-old ones, one of those classic-looking Japanese ones. The garden was full of overgrown weeds on this property, and it looked like it had been abandoned for decades. The four of us crept into the garden area. I was observing the surroundings when the guy in front suddenly stopped. The second guy in line asked what the problem was. There was no reply. The guy in front simply gestured towards something. I looked in that direction, and I saw what had made him silent. We saw Mr. Pop-Up. He was there in his dilapidated garden. He was turned and facing the wall of the house. We could see him from behind. From where we were, it almost appeared like he was floating. I couldn't believe my eyes. I couldn't make out his feet through all the foliage but what he was wearing was tattered and covered in red stains. One of my friends screamed. It felt like he would never stop screaming. Mr. Pop-Up turned his head towards us, and his eyes crossed us over. They locked with mine. A furious look came upon his face, and he began to glare at us. I couldn't stand it any longer. I ran for it. We all ran back towards our high school. I don't know why we'd even decided to do that in the first place. Since that night, we've never returned to the vacant lot. The kids at school still say Mr. Pop-Up watches them play every day. There are some theories from the kids at school about what he is and what he's doing. Some say he's a ghost. Others say he's some sort of alien. But of course, many say our eyes were playing tricks on us or that he was standing on his platform out there in the grass for some reason. Some even insist we were just making it all up. I guess we'll never really know for sure. I'm not exactly keen to go back and check. I went to a pond with two friends of mine after dark. The pond was about 200 feet off a main road, and you had to walk down a gravel driveway to get to it. Important detail, there were no houses neighboring the pond either. Anyway, we were standing at the dock in total darkness when all of a sudden we heard a small splash in the water. It was small enough that at first I thought it was a fish jumping out or something. A few seconds went by and a louder splash took place closer to us. At this point, we were sure someone must have thrown a rock at us. Hello? I called out into the dark, only to get no answer. We were trying to scan the sides of the pond to see if anyone was there, but it was too dark to make out anything. Suddenly, a huge splash came right next to us, clear that someone had just hurled a rock into the water, only a few feet in front of us. It was easy to tell that this was a large 10 pound plus rock too. I yelled out that we were leaving into the dark and we hightailed it out of there. It was really weird and I never went back at night. The weirdest part of this was that the only clear space to stand on was the docks we were on or a tiny patch of grassy area immediately to our left which means that someone was hiding in a bunch of tall reeds, being creepy with us for some reason.
At my school, there's an unused room we call the desk graveyard. What that means is that it's actually just a big storage room with a huge amount of desks stored inside. There are a lot of rumors about the desk graveyard, of course. It's said that sometimes you can hear strange sounds coming from inside, even when there isn't anyone in there. Since this desk graveyard was on the first floor, I guess the noise must have been coming from the second floor. The library was right above it, so it seemed a plausible explanation. The sounds we would hear coming from that room would be like running or rummaging and thumping around. What was a bit curious, though, was that students would not be in the library while we were in regular class time. So when the noises were heard during that time, we started to wonder just what was going on in the desk graveyard. I remember one time this kid from my class had something wrong with his desk. It was wobbling or something. He was told by the teacher to go and exchange it. He said that when he went to the desk graveyard at that time, he could hear the same sounds we had all heard before but up close this time, clearly coming from inside the room. I was tempted to believe it was just an earthquake or something, but the kid was adamant that it was not. He didn't stick around to pick out a new desk, and instead ran back to class. He came back as white as a ghost, and was convinced something paranormal was going on in that room. It was so weird... No one ever wanted to go in there, not even the janitors. Since no one ever went in there, I guessed it didn't really need to be cleaned all that often. I remember more than once hearing the cleaner say that he had been cleaning the corridor in front of it when he began to hear horrible rattling sounds coming from inside. He thought maybe it was the wind, but when he checked, the windows were closed. The principal of our school had been there for a long time. He was actually a former student himself, so I asked him what he knew about the desk graveyard. He said that even back when he was a kid, the exact same room was used for storing desks and nothing more. No one was allowed to go in there without good reason either. He said there were some rumors about that room when he was a boy. I don't know the truth of this matter exactly, but what he told did spook me a bit and made me never want to go in there alone again. He said that before it was used to store desks, heck, before there was even a building in that area, apparently there was a pond in its place. When the school was built on these grounds, a decision was made to fill in that pond. It wasn't a big pond, but it was incredibly deep, and days long gone, Apparently, a young girl had lost her life in the murky depths of that pond. Therefore, the kids who went to the school back then blamed all the noises and strange goings-on on a ghost. The ghost of the girl who lost her life in that pond. I often wonder, if there truly is a ghost in there, what is that little girl trying to communicate with us? Were they just trying to make us aware of their existence? Did they want to let us know that they were there? Did they want to play with children their own age? Or are they somewhere suffering in the afterlife somehow? Either way, I didn't want to go anywhere near the desk graveyard after. Going near it always makes me feel nervous. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, there will be links to my social media in the description below the video, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible.
If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now, guys, so thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.